This is Timmy Fitz. You're listening to the Break It Down Show with Pete and John. Tune in, love it, download it, live it. This episode of the Break It Down Show is a very special one. It's special for three reasons. Number one, Mick Gillette was a formidable part of an essential building block in my musical taste and development. As a founding member of Tower of Power, he created the horn lines and put together the band that helped me understand music. And I can't say enough about that. Second reason is his daughter, the lovely Megan McCarthy, who's the singer in the Mick Gillette Band, and she's great. I really relate to her because I understand what it's like to grow up hearing your father play music and then to evolve to the point where you become a musical co-conspirator with him. So it was great to hear the two of them interact and it was great to relate to them on that level because I make music with my dad. And the third reason is because Mick Gillette is just as cool as you could ever imagine, as I ever imagined, even cooler than that. So, very special episode of the Break It Down show. And one more thing to acknowledge is that I met another one of my heroes, the great Felton Pilot from Confunction, and I asked him what he thought of Mick Gillette, and he said, Mick Gillette is my idol. So we'll post up the Felton Pilot episode very soon. But in the meantime, here's Pete and me with the very lovely Megan McCarthy and one of the coolest, Mick Gillette. Hey, so we are lucky enough to have on the podcast tonight with us on the Break It Down show, fucking A. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ. <laughs> the great Mick Gillette. Oh, is he coming too? Yeah, he's coming too. Yeah, he'll be here. Yeah, I think there he is. Oh, shit. Also, Megan McCarthy, who is Mick's daughter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you are, you're the singer in the band. I am. And you guys are having a good time, huh? Oh, man. This is, I can't even explain it. It's, it's ridiculous. I've, you know, we've, I've been watching him since, you know, I came out. And yeah. now I get to be up there playing with him. And it, and you got to be good enough so it doesn't just look like nepotism, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say the pressure is on more than anything right. else. You know, totally. you probably have more pressure leaning on you than anything totally. else. You really have to deliver. It's important. Yeah. I don't want to suck. Nobody wants to suck. <laughs> no, she's got the right attitude for it. It's a, she's a, she's a natural, and her pitch is wonderful. Her ideas are beautiful. She's been listening to so many people over the years. You know, she in high school she could jump into her car, and the kids all going out to get lunch somewhere, and she's slamming Aretha Franklin and some. You know, and you're Wilson, educating people. Oh, Wilson picking up going, what's that? You know, it's like my wife, she, she's a little bit younger than me, too, but when she came to me one day, she says, you got to hear this brand new tune, man, it is so funky. And this is, we're talking about, you know, 1994. She goes, yeah, man, it's this guy named Edwin Starr, he caught 25 miles. Well, you got to hear this. I said, that, yeah. that's from 68, <laughs> maybe 69. So, you know, it's all, it's all an education. You learn in your whole he life. He played Woodstock. <laughs> Close. That's a funny one, man, because I was in cold blood for a while, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but... The leader of Cold Blood runs into Bill Graham's office, and, and is re- he's pretty toasted. He breaks off the top of a bottle, and he's chasing Bill Graham around his office, trying to cut him with the bottle, saying, you never get us any good gigs. And Cold Blood was, <laughs> Cold Blood was pretty big at the time, and they helped me get out of the draft and, and during Vietnam and stuff. So I joined. I left Tower for about nine months. And while I was in the band, the Tower was gaining, and I played on the first album, but then because I left during the recording of the album, they put, called me a mellow side order on the back of the album. There were all my arrangements, and the, I built the horn section. There. So anyway, he runs into Bill's office, and he's chasing him around. And Bill goes, no, I got a great gig for you guys. You're not going to believe this one. And he goes, no, you're not. So finally he had to have his employees come in and tackle him and haul him out of there. And he sent Santana to Woodstock instead of Cold Blood, because Cold Blood was supposed to be on Woodstock. Wow. Yeah, no Santana kidding. went instead. Man. Yeah. So you've a lot of our listeners will know that, you know, you, of course— played with Tower of Power, but for our younger listeners, they don't know that that means that the time span that you played with Tower of Power, the Tower of Power horn section played with everybody. That was my horn section. I built it. Yeah. I was the only horn in the band for a year. Wow. And I and just on trumpet. And then I figured, oh, I better start fattening this up, so I got a flugelhorn, you know, to play on the ballads. Yeah. And then I found an old buddy of mine, uh, Skip Mesquite, who's a dad and my dad played together. 
And uh, it's, it's funny because both of our kids now have, have done things together too. Wow. And, and they both have little ones, so they're going to be like four or five generations of the Mesquites and the Gillettes gigging together before too long here. But uh, I built that horn section up to five horns, you know, and, and to where we were getting, you know, our first big recording session was the very last Big Brother and the Holding Company album that Janis Joplin was on. It was called Be a Brother. And Nick Gravenides was sort of taking over the band. And we played on that, and next thing you know, we're doing uh, Santana's third album, uh, Everybody's Everything. That's that's one of my arrangements on that one. And uh, this, things just started opening up. And then uh, I have a discography on, on my website, uh, makeslight.com, and it's there's... We probably have four or five hundred albums listed on that. Wow, yeah. four or five hundred albums. Oh, at least, uh, and those are the ones we listed. Look at this guy. I know, man. You look great. <laughs> it's great just to be, you know, looked at, and not viewed. Yeah, yeah. No kidding. Yeah. I mean, really, for as long as you've been around making music, and you've played the soundtrack of my life. I mean, when I was a little kid, my dad was a sax player, so I've been listening to your stuff. Literally all my life, too. Mm-hmm. I've had grown people walk up to me and say, I'm here because of you still a young man. Yeah, you know? I bet. I bet. <laughs> that my mom was like... once a diamond sparkling in the sand. Oh, you, know? you better believe it. <laughs> That's my favorite flugelhorn solo I've ever played on that. Album. Wow. Man. So, But now you've got uh, the Mick Gillette Band, and you guys are playing... Uh... We're playing all over Northern California at this point, and even down to South a little bit. We did some uh, jazz festivals and stuff last year. And uh, we're really got it functioning now. We're a completely self-contained unit. Megan's doing the bulk of the lead singing. I'm actually doing some singing now just to give my chops a break every once in a while. I've got the old sax player from Cold Blood in, in the band with me. We're, and our, our keyboard player, this remarkable guy named Ryan Haberger, uh, he went to college on a, on a trumpet scholarship, and he's my keyboard player. And he tells me he plays trumpet too. So I said, well, bring it. And now he's playing through half the set. He's, he's blowing well, you know, I met Ryan a couple weeks ago, mm-hmm. and man, what a great guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's pleasant. And he was telling me, yeah, man, and uh, so there I am, and uh, Mick Gillette tells me to pick up the trumpet. Yeah. I said, get it. Yeah. And then he said, well, it's, you, know, you had this old-fashioned style, of, we call it a pressure mouthpiece, which is kind of painful, and it makes, it makes you want to kind of get away from the horn for a little bit. Well, they've invented new mouthpieces that are easier to play. All the pros are playing them, and you can play longer, you can play higher, you can play better. So I said, well, why don't you try one of these? And all the next thing you know, man, he's blazing. He's writing tunes for the new album and stuff. He's, he's, just, he's a full-blown member of this band. Yeah, but that's like Ted Williams going, hey, hey, kid. Hey, kid. Pick grab up a, a bat. bat. Yeah, grab You're a hitting bat. in the two spot. <laughs> <laughs> and then put these batting gloves on. Now, let's, let's throw them some heat. Yeah, let's go. And, and lift that hitting. left elbow just a little bit. So, you know, that's what I do. I'm going to teach her now. I, I've been teaching since I was nine years old. And I've been playing since I was four. I, I, I got a funny story for you. My, my father, uh, I have an older brother, three years older. So he was seven, I was four, and my dad brought home a trumpet for him. My dad being a, a, an amazing professional trombone player, Ray Gillette. And um, my older brother's named after him. He's Ray Gillette the Third, and he bought him a trumpet for my older brother. And he didn't really like it that much. And I, I, I kept telling my dad, "Hey, I want to play it." And he goes, "No, you're you're still too young. <laughs> you're still <laughs> a young man. Leave that alone, kid. <laughs> you're still a young man." <laughs> so, I, and yeah, he said, "No, oh, you're going to drop it and break it now." And so, me being the uh, evil little kid that I was, I would wait till everybody left the room, then I would go sneak the trumpet out of the closet, and play it. Man, and so I'd watch him give my brother lessons, and then I'd go on the sly, play what he taught. My brother wasn't picking it up, and I was sitting on the bed, fingering notes with my hand, going, "Come on, you can do this." And one day, I'm, I'm, he teaches my brother how to play a simple little C scale on the trumpet, and and uh, he's just not getting it. And I'm going, "Man, this is so easy." He, he gets to the give me that thing. He gets to the fifth note, and I said, "It's open." And my dad turned, and he goes, "Shh." It's open. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so they, they leave, and, and I see my brother run by the window in the back of the house, and I hear the garage door shut, and I'm pretty sure my dad's going out to the shop. So I went and grabbed the trumpet real quick, and I'm sitting on the bed, and da, 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 this is so easy, da, 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 and the door opens, and there stands my dad, and I'm busted. Now, my dad was an ex-Marine, and, he, and it's just in the 50s. You know, those days when you got a whooping, it wasn't child abuse, it was called a whooping. He was a Marine. You're never an ex-Marine. No, no. Yeah, he was a Marine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but he was in Bob Crosby's band in the Marine Corps, so it wasn't that bad a duty, you all know, right, all stationed right. in Pearl Harbor. <laughs> but so he, uh, he, he looks around, and he goes, where's your brother? And right then my brother goes running by the back window, and I said, he, he's right there. <laughs> and he goes, that was you? And I go, yeah, Dad, I'm sorry. I know he's going to get the belt. I'm in trouble. I said, I, I was real careful. He goes, that was you? 
And I said, yeah, I really want to play the trumpet, please. And he goes, do that again. And I thought, oh, man, here's my ticket. I, and I played it perfectly. I played that scale. And he looked at me with his eyes got real big. And he goes, well, I'll be darned. He ran over, grabbed me, grabbed the horn. And when he came at me, I thought, okay, that's it. I'm in trouble. He's going to bend this thing around my <laughs> oh, head. Oh, <laughs> man, he, we jammed to the car. He drove an hour and a half to the best music store he could find to get the biggest trumpet book he could find. And we sat in the parking lot of that music store until the sun went down. By the time I got home, I could, I could read music. I was four years old. Wow. I was reading. I got home, and I started practicing seven hours, five to seven hours a day, seven days a week. I, was, I became a child prodigy. I, I was around so many incredible musicians all the time Yeah, that I just wanted to play the horn. And so for my eighth birthday, I walk in, and this trumpet book is, we call it the Trumpet Player's Bible. It's the Arben's book. Big, thick, giant book, 400-page book. And it's a lifetime-type book. You'll never go, you get rid of that book. And for my eighth birthday... I've been using this book now for four years. I said, I, I need a new book. And he goes, yeah. He goes, when you could play everything in that book, there are college audition pieces in there. He goes, we'll find you a new book. And I, cocky little bastard that I was, I handed him. Pick a page, Dad. I, that's exactly what I told him. He said, here, pick a page. So he goes right to the back of the book, to the college audition piece, and he goes, yeah, this one looks kind of like Flight of the Bumblebee. Give this one a shot, right. would you? Yeah. And then I go, gee, Dad, you picked a really hard page. He said, no, you said you could play any page in the book. Well, it opened to that page because... It was always open to that page. Right. It was my favorite page. That was the page book. you creased I had to open. Memorized. Oh, no, I've been through What the was it? It's uh, one of the characteristic stages, the college audition piece, number 14 uh-huh. in the Arbin's book, in the back of the book. And uh, so he, he, he looks down the page and he goes, it, it, just, it looks like some fly had diarrhea over page. It was just, <laughs> you know, like Victor Borga says, what are all these dots, you know? <laughs> and so he, uh, he, says, uh, he says, okay, well, you should, it looks like you should be able to do this page in about six breaths, but you're going to have to play it fast. I went, okay. So I stand right in front of him, and he, of course, reads music real well. And I walk around behind the stand so I can watch him read the page while I play it because I've got it memorized. <laughs> and I, by the time I hit the first breath mark, he's just grinning ear to ear. And I get to the bottom of it, and he made me play the whole page. Yeah. And I made it. And he looks at me, and he goes, Time for a new book. We're going to have to find you a new book. There are no better books than that. That's the last day I practiced. I haven't practiced one day since I was eight years old. Wow. I don't practice. I play all the time. I play. I'll play in five or six different bands at a time. Yeah, you know, there are different days I'm playing different bands. You know, so I just always play it. I'm a player. It's what I do. But to me, practicing sounds lonely. Hearing my trumpet all by itself, I need somebody playing with me. It's a me. solitary existence. I don't. That's not me. I, you know, it's not like an acoustical guitar where you can sit there and play the, be the whole band. You know, so it's, uh, I just that's what I do. I, I, I'm a player, man. My dad was a player. All his buddies were players. I just assumed the position. Your dad is annoying. He hasn't practiced <laughs> since he was eight years old. I've heard that. What in the hell? I haven't practiced the trumpet in decades either. Yeah. Uh, but I don't play. Yeah. Making make an 11 out of it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no. No, I'm not. That's a hell of a story. Where and were you had, at the time? Because you had Victor Borga in it, too. Yeah. Every story should head. have Victor Borga in it. Man, that guy's hilarious. <laughs> that trained her right or what, man? Yeah. We were in, we were in uh, Fremont. Okay. I grew up in Fremont. Actually, I, I was uh, when I was born. I, I lived in Pleasant Hill, and it was right after we turned moved to Fremont before I turned five. And as a matter of fact, I, I got into playing so so much immediately that uh, on uh, Memorial Day of 1956, I just turned five, and my they, they hired some high school kid to go play taps in the in the cemetery for all the veterans out. The, and my dad was a veteran, so he goes, "I'll tell you what," he says, "I'm going to teach you how to play taps, and what we're going to do is we're going to have you hide behind a headstone and." play an echo and then it'll be kind of creepy being on a cemetery and hearing an echo come from nowhere because i'm so little it's really i just stand behind a headstone nobody can see i'm there so this kid's out there and thing and they da, 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 and then out of nowhere and my dad's in there directing me with his finger you know and uh, they get done and, and the, the one of the vets walks over and hands the kid, the kid 10 bucks for for playing taps in the 1956 you know, that was he, a lot of money. He probably won't go buy a car or something, you know. <laughs> that was, yeah. Man. And, and, they, and, and then I come walking out behind the headstone holding this trumpet, which looks like a man holding a tuba because, you know, I'm so little and the trumpet is so big. And they, all the veterans walked over to me and started handing me dollar bills to the point where I had to hand my father my trumpet. And, and I'm, I'm holding this. I ended up making 25 bucks Whoa. for playing the Echo to Taps. Uh, five years, and I'm going. That's a hell of a practical joke to start off with. You know, and, and then my you dad, made twenty five bucks. My dad's sort of shaking his head, going, "Oh, that's nineteen fifty six. You could buy a right. house in Vallejo at the time <laughs> yeah, a, a with the backyard." Of, yeah. <laughs> and and he I, he looked at me, and I said, "Dad, I'm going to be a trumpet player when I grow up." Wow. 
I have I, known you all are, my life. You already yeah, are. You Man, already I had are. buddies. Yep. I know buddies that were wanted to be firemen, wanted to be cowboys, wanted to be baseball players. Yeah. I'm going to be a trump player. And they're all looking at me like I'm weird. Well, I don't know one of them that's a cowboy. None of them are firemen. <laughs> Nobody's a cowboy. None of them are playing baseball. <laughs> uh-huh. I'm playing trumpet. I've always known. I've There's that one kid, it. and he is a ballerina, mm-hmm. but that's another story. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, he's, he's, he, he used to be Eugene. Now it's just Gene. Yeah. You know? <laughs> hey, I have to, though, uh, acknowledge Jason Stewart because he put us together. Jason's awesome, man. He's the he's the newest member of the band, and he joined us. Gosh, uh, October, November, around there somewhere. Yeah, he was, Angelica's was his first gig, so that was November. Oh, that's right. Yeah, actually, yeah, on yeah. his birthday. Yes, that was it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he, his he, birthday was his first gig with you guys. Mm-hmm. Yes, wow, it yeah. was. And yeah. he, what a find he is, man. He's just is so tasty, man. We're doing uh, um, on on our new album, Turn It Two. We've uh, Megan brings me these tunes. You know, we write tunes, some of it original, some of it we're, we're doing some, some rehashes of old tunes, but we're not a cover band, so mm-hmm. we're not playing them like they did. Yeah. She brings this Patsy Cline tune in, and it's got slide guitar and violin on it, and I'm going, uh, it's called uh, uh, I Love You Honey. I Love You Honey. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's this old Patsy Cline tune. And, I'm, and, and I listen to it, and I went, you know, I really don't want to do country in West Virginia. She goes, I don't care, it's a cute tune, do something with it. I said, well... I mean, what if I do Dixieland on her something? She goes, that's a good idea. It's now our entrance tune. We walk in playing this, and it turns from the, more from the, when the Saints go marching in. We got a marching bass drum, marching snare drum. The band walks into the, the, the venue playing, and we get on stage and let into the song, and it is so fun, man. We're having a ball playing this. Man, that is cool. And Jason, you know, Jason, what's he doing? He's, 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 uh, he's playing. Jason has the... Shaking a tambourine Yeah, I think it's the tambourine. It could be the tambourine. No, he had, I think he had the cowbell. Oh, that could very he well was be. Proud of his cowbell. Yeah, that was that would be him. And then, but then she comes in, and, she, and, and, uh, and another buddy of ours comes in, and he goes, "Man, he goes, you, you've done something really unique there with that old song." And he said, "I, I get this, this song. I would love to hear you guys do. It's this old Hank Williams song called Cold Cold Heart.'" Mm-hmm. And it's and and uh, I went, "Okay, well, let's, uh, we better take that somewhere else." It and is, it made its way onto the oh, record too. Did you hear what did. she does? She just turned it into magic, and, and Jason puts this just sneaky, sly little guitar stuff behind it. The song was, was, was kind of in place, but it was really missing something. And he put, you know, six notes every two minutes, and it was just the yeah. perfect stuff, man. So I, I, I thank God for sending me, sending me Jason Stewart. <laughs> man, that is a hell of a compliment. And I agree with you. I've known Jason Stewart for a long, long time. We I'm played not... in a band together when I was about 18 or 19 mm. years old. Mm. He played in my dad's band. And I remember one time we were playing in Fairfield, and we were doing this outdoor gig. And, you know, outdoor gigs always sound great. Oh, it sounds great, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, like you can almost hear the sunshine. Mm-hmm. Mm. And we did mm-hmm. something. I can't remember what it was. It was like a bossa nova. I think it was Bobbles, Bangles, and Beads. Oh, God. <laughs> and then, like, we did a, a break, and Jason came in. And I think he played the two most perfect notes I've ever heard in my life. Because <laughs> he something? started playing, and I just went... Oh man! Yeah, it sounds like the sun is out. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, he's really something. I was not a fan. I've never in my life been a big fan of rock and roll. Yeah, which is you know funny coming from me, man. I've I've stood on stages with the Rolling Stones. You know, I worked with uh, all the Beatles, except like Paul McCartney. You know, I've, I've I've got to be in some of the best stages for rock and roll ever. But I'm just not a huge fan. Of it. My favorite rock band and the band that really turned me on to rock was Little Feet. Wow. And I love Little Feet. And another song of our new album is is uh, the Little Feet Let It Roll song. Paul Barrera, the leader of the band, is a dear friend of mine. Huh. And he wrote the song. And I said, why don't you come play it with us? So he's on the, uh, he's on the album. Wow. Yeah, and he just, he plays slide on it. It's just, it's a straight ahead rock tune. I played on the original recording on, on the horns. Well, you played with everybody. It yeah. feels like nope. sometimes. <laughs> everybody. You know, uh, over 30 members of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We were going to say, uh, uh, you played with, well, basically, we have a thing we call Rock and Roll Mountain. We're trying to figure out where people are on it. And there's a lo- level of greatness that once you're above it, you're great. You're not trying to say who is the greatest and who's not. But seriously, at the top of Rock and Roll Mountain, it's the Rolling Stones. You know, they are there. Yep. And you can put the Beatles right there next to them. You can put Elvis up there. We think those guys are all can claim the very top. Mm-hmm. When the Beatles wanted to do something better, they called you. <laughs> You're right. Hey, how do we kick this up a notch? Yeah. Huh. The funny one is one since you were talking about the Stones, is Bill Graham brought the Stones to Candlestick Park. This is 1981. And uh, they had a friend of ours, Ernie Watts, playing tenor sax with him for years. Just, uh-huh. just all these was rock and roll sax. And Bill Graham says, why don't you guys come play a song with the Stones, man? And we're all going, 
okay, <laughs> you know, well, that <laughs> yeah. sounds good. So we go to we go to Candlestick, and he says, just come to the dressing room during the sound check and meet the guys and talk it over with them. So we go walking in, and, and I'm thinking about this. I'm going, you know, uh, years ago, Mick Jagger and Otis Redding, of all people, wrote a song together called Satisfaction. And the Rolling Stones do this old, slow, well, when uh, Otis Redding did it, he did it up in a higher key, but he snapped it and put horns on it and did it much faster. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I, we walk in the dressing room and we already knew Keith Richards. We met Keith several times and Ron Wood. We'd work with the faces. And uh, Mick goes, well, What are we going to do? What do you guys know that we can do? And I said, Well, do you guys ever play Satisfaction anymore? And he goes, Oh yeah, we we haven't played in a little while, but we all know that, you know. I remember that tune. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and, yeah. He, and uh, I said, "Well, do you still play it anymore?" And he goes, "Yeah." And I said, "Well, we we played the Otis Redding version of it for years." I said, and he goes, "Oh, but see now, that's a lot different than the way we do it." And I, I can't even fake Mick Jagger's uh, accent, but I I know he, he, that lip goes out about here. And and uh, Mick says. Mick says, well, we do it a lot slower. I don't know if they'll recognize it. I'll tell you what. I said, if you, we'll slow ours down. If you can pick yours up just a little. Meet we'll, in the middle. We'll do it any key you want. And he goes, you can do that? I said, that's why we're here. We're Tower of Power, baby. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. I said, that's why Bill asked us to come in and we can do this. Yeah. So so we, we work it up and we, we're in the dressing room playing it. And, and Keith Richards is just flipping out he's running around the room playing this is the best that we're going to use those horns so we were up on stage standing and they're going to play the uh, satisfaction for the last song on the set there's 78,000 people in candlestick park and they got these special stage on set but we're, we're behind some big giant curtains on stage about four songs we're supposed to play and they break into jumping jack flash and, and I, we're back behind a curtain i'm going Doc, play this. You know, I gave him a couple of scoop parts to play, and, and then I, I'm showing the horn some other parts. You play the seven, you play the third, just, you know, jumping, bow, bow, ba da 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 ba ba da ba And we were playing some snappy little horn stuff, and, and the song's <laughs> just about over, and all of a sudden, Jagger comes, during the song, comes running behind the curtain, and he goes, he listens to us for a second, and he goes, get out here! And so we run up on the stage, thinking we're going to finish the song with him, and he stops the song, and he walks up to the microphone, and he goes, wait till you hear this! And he starts the song over again. <laughs> but take this, this this silly little horn arrangement that I made up on the spot. Yeah. The horn section that plays with the Stones Live Now plays that same arrangement plays note for note. <laughs> And we get done with it with the, with uh, Jumpin' Jack Flash, and I'm going, okay, this is the crowd's going nuts. They know who we are. It's a it's a local people. Yeah. And and Jagger goes, he goes, all right, because you guys ready for satisfaction? And I go, yeah, we're ready. He goes, good, we're doing brown sugar. Make something up. <laughs> Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> All right. And so we did. They're yeah. using that arrangement to this day. Wow. Man. And they're using a five piece horn section. Yeah. So, you know, we make, we leave a dent wherever we go. I you know? guess, <laughs> man. You know, we, we, we aren't great, but the great don't f- mess with us. <laughs> <laughs> I would say you're great. You that's, made, that's you a made level Keith of humility Richards that's... excited about playing Satisfaction. Again. Yeah. 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 We, we turned Keith around. Keith, there's so many funny stories about Keith, which are not for public. Publication, but there the, the I was privy to, but uh, one of the, there was a party in my room in Amsterdam. We were on a big uh, Warner Brothers tour with Little Feet and Grand Central Station and Montrose and and uh, Doobie Brothers and a band called Bonnaroo, and uh, we're having a big party at a big dinner in Amsterdam, and I'm at a table with Keith and Billy Preston's there and a writer from Rolling Stone and Doc and myself, and uh, so some guy breaks through the crowd and runs up and just throws his Big bag of cocaine on the table in front of, in front of uh, Keith, and Keith goes, no, no, no. And he pushes it away. And he, goes, he reaches in his pocket, and goes, I got me own, <laughs> and he takes the bag in his pocket, and we end up going up to the room and, and listening, and uh, and he, he says, man, he says they they never went. I've been on the road again without a five piece horn section since we sat in with them. Wow. And it was, we left an impression. It, I it, guess it makes a difference. Horns make a difference. Yes, they absolutely do. And and uh, I'm I'm what's known as a spot arranger. I'll make up stuff on stage as we go. What, is, what song is it? Yeah. It's uh, songs I don't even know sometimes. And uh, I'll, I'll learn it the first time through, the second time. And uh, the kind of guys I like playing with in my section. I've always been the section leader. And and, and between myself and Greg Adams, the, Greg Adams was uh, the trumpet player and tower player. And yeah. he, when stuff was, was really elaborate and the big sweeping ballads, he'd write everything out. And he, he was just 
eloquent writer for that stuff. He's one of the best, you know, sweeping ballad writers I've ever heard. Uh-huh. And he made me sound like a million bucks. So I, I, I've never had a complaint about Greg's arranging. But most of the old funk stuff, that's mine. Okay. You listen to old East Bay Grease, and Bob City, and those things. Yeah. You know, what is up? Those are my arrangements. I made up that stuff. I'd tell the guys, that I'd, I'd throw them a line, and I'd say, You got the three, you got the seven. I'm playing the tonic on top, Doc. You got the tonic. You can change between the five and the nine, and we got some nice chords going on here, and all of a sudden, you know, I, I, when I play a, a, a line, I look at the guys, and by the third or fourth time we've done this, they go right to their harmony and are playing it with me the second time. Or we're hearing it once. They're playing it second time in harmony. Yeah. So that's the kind of section we had, and that's why we got so much work. Right. Well, it's not like you guys didn't have the practice, that's for sure. I mean, yeah, you practice. sure had the time together. You know, you know I, I haven't practiced since I was eight years old. I call practicing a waste of time. You know, I'm, I'm a Yamaha clinician, yeah. and I work with a lot of schools. Yeah. My, I, my wife and I have a company called Music in the Schools. I go all over the country working with a lot of middle school and high school and some college bands, some even drum and bugle corps. And when I walk in, I just give them the ideas of where, where and how the stuff is going to sound and feel better and feel right. And how, like uh, uh, we were talking a little while ago, and you asked how funk is, is explained. Yeah. To, to lay down funk, and we spell it with an O, you know, if you spell funk right, if you if you play funk right, your it's lawn funky. your lawn is gonna die, and the next door neighbor's dog is gonna be pregnant. I mean, the guy's <laughs> got stuff's got to be nasty. Yeah. All right. Well, the thing is that somebody has to be playing straight ahead rhythms, and somebody plays the off sixteenth jabs mm-hmm. that that make those stabs to make it just fit. So that stuff. Right. Well, that's the David Garibaldi school of funk with Rocco, and there's you know that stuff. Yeah. Somebody has to be laying down the straight ahead stuff, so the the other section, other part of the band can lay, can do the funk stabs. Can mess with your back. And and if the, the rhythm section is taken out, then the horn section goes. We start building tension by playing something really steady that you can just lean on, and then the funk always works, and you'll always be able to get back home. Yeah. So that's how funk works. Somebody has to be laying it down straight. And then again, there's the real important part of our playing in the center of the beat, because the, there's three different ways to play on time. One is pushing the beat. So that, 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 but then it. So when some of it is just dead in the center, like the old squib cakes line. It sits right in the middle. Right. Then there's the old bassy style. Where you're on the back yeah, of the beat. On... It's not late, but it's on the back of right, the beat. Right. So everybody has to agree where that's going to be. Yeah. And that's, the, that's why the drummer and the bass player are the motor, and we're the bus, you know, and just don't get thrown under it while you're going because you want to. Wanna... Is this a big, thick bus? You, and you want people to come back and hear you again, you know? And, and we, we've always been a musician's band. You know, the general public didn't get us. Yeah. A lot, a, lot, a lot of it today still doesn't. But the musicians go, oh, my God. There's a musician I've met that didn't want to play in that band at some other time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's a great credential for a lot of guys. You know, Lenny Pickett, man, he runs a Saturday Night Live band. And he's, he's been running. The, I have an 18-year-old. I'm, he's not 18. He's 17. My son is 17 years mm-hmm. old. And Lenny Pickett's been running that band since 1995. Yeah. 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 I he mean, he's been running Western that band for a long time. Yeah. My My... Kids' entire life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We found Lenny Pickett. We were playing the Keystone Berkeley, and our sax player came in one night, and he was loaded, as Ron Light would say. And he walked into the dressing room and took his horn out of the case and promptly dropped it on a cement floor where it went into about 600 pieces. Uh-huh. And we walked out front, and Pickett's sitting on the street out front playing a saxophone for quarters, throw it into a sax case. And we're going, You want to play some tunes? Come on in, Lenny. He was in the band from then. How was he when he walked in? Crazy. Wow. <laughs> just totally insane. Man. Yeah. And just, just you know, the, the, he was a very impoverished kid. And he, was, he, was, he would live off the money he made in his horn case playing on, on the street. And the next thing you know, man, he's buying six, $1,600, $1,700 tuxedos. Yeah. And he's dancing. And he's doing his crazy dances and his hand bone stuff. And, right. and people ate it up. You know, we're like, I'm going, you're crazy. And they're, they're eating it up. So we're going. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it'll fit right in. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, we were choreographed. You know, we, we, that was a fun thing about watching a bunch. You know, one of the reviews called the, the Tower of Power Horn section looked like the UCL, UCLA line gone to bad seed. <laughs> and it was just, a, we, we were up there dancing and everybody looking so weird and stupid, but the steps would all be really together. Yeah. And we wouldn't do it too much because, you know, we're not, we're not the Temptations. Right. You know, we're not the Pips. Matter of fact, we called ourselves the Pits. The because, Pips. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Gladys had our Pips. We were the Tower. We had the Pits. You know, so... We were, the, we were the, we called our back.
background singers, the pits, and our dancers. We were the pits. Just enough to be charming. Yeah. It's like Man. cold blood. We used to call it the clot. If you like the show, and you know you do, send us some pictures and movies. Don't do that. Support the show. There are three ways you can support us. Number one, go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. And leave a five-star rating in with you. It helps with the show metrics and helps us get better placement. Number two, visit our website, www.breakitdownshow.com. We've got an Amazon and an eBay link. Same Amazon, same eBay, you know and love, but they give us a little kickback when you get to their site from ours. And number three, leave comments about the shows that you like. We want to know what you think, how you feel. Tell us how to make the show better. We greatly appreciate it. Now back to the show. We like boobies. But uh, <laughs> LP, Lenny Pickett, Pickett, what year did you join the band? That had to be about 73. 73. Yeah, we were doing the Tower of Power album. And that was when Rick Stevens had been our lead singer. Yeah. And Rick fell into hard times and, uh, and really got wrapped up in some bad drugs and some really bad people. Man. And, uh, yeah. Well, you know, Rick, he was the best uh, uh, up until just very recently. The new lead singer I was down is just sparkling. But Rick was had always been the best showman, lead singer of that band. He just was. Wow. He, he'd walk in and just own a crowd. They'd be in his pocket two minutes after he started talking, and then they just love what he did. You know, Lenny Williams sang all the big hits, yeah. and he, he got that magical, that preacher's voice. He's got all that stuff. Sure. Those are the, the, the two biggest, best singers that, that were in the band when I was there. But you'd say Rick is a, more of a showman. Oh yeah! Oh no! He, he's, he's his uncle was Ivory Joe Hunter. I mean, he just—it was in his blood. He, yeah. he just—he just had it, and he was a bit older than the rest of the band. And the funny thing is now that after spending thirty-four years incarcerated for three murders and a kidnapping, yeah, but it was all over a bad drug deal. And when he was, you know, he cleaned up, and he's been a man of God ever since. And he's—he's he's actually a, a very nice guy. But there's still a lot of people that shy away from him just because of what happened. Right. You know, there are people who may never come back to his fold. And, and where he's and been. some people, you know, you know, they talk about forgiveness stuff there's some heavy things that, that some people are not able to forgive i was able to, to see through it myself because i remembered how good a guy he was right and uh when he got came back out i was the, i got him his first gig after he got out of prison oh good i uh, i got together with uh, jeff tamalier the he old, just got uh, out like with, about within two and the and last year now, two yeah, and a half two years, years. Yeah. yeah and 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 i i did all the horns from on his on his first album out after he came back and i've helped him i've done some gigs with him and stuff and now he's out working he actually works with uh, cold blood a bit now with lydia pence Good, but uh, I helped him get back on his feet and stuff. And it's you know I can't call him my best friend, but we're friends and we're musical friends, especially. So that in that you know in that form, it's you know it's all building and, and making this life happen. Music is 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 so amazing. Right man. on, man. I have to say, right on. Yeah, it, that's it, a great story. It is is so amazing, man. You know, it, it, music has its own language. Yeah, and the communications you use to to, to in music is like if somebody comes up to you and starts babbling at you in, in Cantonese or Tagalog, you can. Know, Look at him and go, you know, okay, you know, uh, no sabe, you know, I'm not sure how to say this in your language, but I don't know what you're telling me. But, but if you, you start playing if music, you, you say or sing to them, you emote to them musically, and they know right. what you I'm happy, I'm intense, I'm strong, I'm simple, I'm clean. You know, you can tell all them those all, feelings, and they'll everybody know can what relate you're to. telling them. You got it, yeah. and that's what I love about music, man. Well, you've been loving music, and we've been loving that you've been making music for all these years. Well, thank you, man. I, I'm blessed. My, my father was the best musician I ever met. And uh, the best trombone players I ever met all called my father the master. Man. Yeah. So when you were growing up, though, your dad was playing with some really heavy cats himself. Yeah, the Tommy Dorsey band. Uh, he got kicked out of Tommy's band for kicking Tommy's butt on trombone. Uh, he was playing Harry James band for a little while. He uh, Count Basie whenever he came to town. He just knew every Stan Kenton. Stan Kenton kept, kept trying to get me. I was playing so much lead trumpet by the time I became a freshman in high school. And he had wanted my dad to come back on the road with him. He thought if he got me in his band, my dad would have to go. <laughs> so <laughs> as a freshman in high school, Stan Kenton was coming around saying, you got to come on the road with me. Forget about it. You don't need school. You're a player. Come play. And, I'm, and you thought about it. Oh, for about uh, you know a couple of seconds, and I thought that that's really silly. Yeah. You know, besides that, tour buses in those days, you got on a tour bus for six months before you got back home. You know, and and, and the pay wasn't good. It was just to go out and play that music with the best cats, right? Which is really spectacular. And that bus was not air conditioned. No, no, and the sax players always sat right behind you, man. It just sucks. <laughs> you know the difference between a big band and a bull? What? With the big bands, the horns are in the front, and the assholes in the back. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a podcast. It's a podcast. Yeah, you 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 want. My daughter's here. You know, I try to keep it. Uh-huh. You try, you uh, try she's never work. heard any yeah. of this before. I don't buy that for a yeah. second. Not you a know second. you're never supposed to give a trumpet player a microphone, right? Or cash. Yeah, now we know. <laughs> <Yeah>. Or cash. <laughs> <laughs> and I show up and I get both. <laughs> They're in trouble, man. Yeah. So where did you go to high school? Uh, in Fremont, Mission San Jose High School. Okay. Graduated in 1969. By the time I was a sophomore in high school, I was running the uh, the uh, Miss Fremont pageant. I was doing all the music for all the girls doing the acts. And for my junior year, they I did the Miss California pageant. And I had my dad and Skip Mesquite's dad and Skip and and the drummer, uh, the original drummer from Tower of Power. That was my band. Yeah. So we went down to Santa Cruz and did the Miss California pageant. I was, I was doing all kind of crazy. Music yeah, I was going to say you said no freshman year to going out on the road, but but it wasn't long before you were going to have to be busy. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, got, I got scholarships. I was offered lots of scholarships. I can audition anything. I was getting command performances when I was nine years old right. playing Hyde the Trumpet Concerto. And I, I'm convinced to this day it was because my pianist, the accompanist, was five. And he was better than me. I mean, he, he runs theater uh, orchestra, pit orchestras in New York. And he did Cats. And this guy, Johnny Johnson, is just, right. you know, freaky good. And he couldn't even reach the pedals on the piano. And he's playing the company. And I'm doing it. And people are just watching us going, who are these kids playing this stuff? And, and I burnt out on classical music. I just got really tired of it. My, my last classical uh, concert I did, uh, I, I got hired to play uh, in the Fremont Philharmonic Symphony. And uh, it was a you know public symphony, and and, and they, they uh, hired their conductor to come in, and they had no trumpet player, so the musicians unit got a hold of me and said, "Come down and play. We'll pay you seventy five dollars for rehearsal and one hundred twenty five dollars for the concert the next day." And my father's playing trombone, and he just donates his time. My sister's playing bassoon; she was an amazing bassoonist. And uh, so I go down to the rehearsal, and uh, I'm already in tower, and I'm you know I'm traveling the world. And, okay, I'll we'll, we'll do this. What the heck? It's right in town. And I go in and I look down at the sheet of music and it's got 1,163 measures rest before I come in. Oh! And it's got wow. 17 notes and I'm done. And there's still more that I have to sit through. Uh. And it's, it's already classical music. It was, it was a, some Schubert symphony or something, I believe. And so I'm sitting there and I go, oh my God. And it's, it's slow. You know, so here I am, 62, 2, 3, 4, 63, you know. A thousand one, two, and I'm counting, you know, and I look over and there's this cute little girl playing second violin over there. And I look over and I go, oh, and she looked over and winked at me and I went, okay, well, you know, symphony I'll music is it's not all while. bad. <laughs> I said, and, and, then all of a sudden, and then all of a sudden I went, oh. I lost count. Oh, no. So I'm looking up the clock. And you and had I'm to going, count to 1163. <laughs> I'm looking up at the clock, and I'm going, okay, we started about 10 minutes ago. Probably the next three or four minutes I need to be able to play. What a stupid thing to get caught in. So I'm sitting there, and I get my horn ready, and I'm looking. The part's pretty simple to play, and I'm looking at the conductor, and I'm, I'm sort of quizzically looking at him, and he, he already, oh, Lost your place. Uh, the only other guy, only other guy in the house who's getting paid to be here. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sitting there waiting for him, and, and 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 all of a sudden he just stops the orchestra and he looks at him and he goes, "You know, for a professional musician, you really let us down here. You know, you, you only have what is it, 17 notes to play, and we waited for, uh, for almost 15 minutes for your entrance, and you missed it." You know, I know it's a lot of majors to count, but you can count, can't you? My father walks over and kicks my chair, and he goes, we're going to start this piece over again, and the whole orchestra groans. <laughs> he couldn't back up four majors and bring me in. Come on. So, yeah. So I went, oh, and he goes, he goes, uh, he goes I, I'll even give you a clue. He goes, you double the oboe part. Mr. Oboe player knows how to count, and he'll make sure you don't miss that part. They're not going to want to start this piece again. So what started now, and, and, and I, I, I didn't need to count. I knew exactly what his part was, and I just sat there and just, he wouldn't look at me because I'm burning holes through his head, and yeah. I'm, I'm not happy. And, uh, and so we get to the spot, and this time he looks over at me like he's supposed to about four majors before I come in and puts his hand in the air like, your part's coming up. Yeah. He didn't do this for me the first time. Right, like I he should have done the first yeah. time. And the part comes in, and he waves his hand right at me, and bing, I came in, played my 17 notes. I thought perfectly, not overbearing. Just nailed the... Dun, 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 I don't even remember the part. 17 notes. I get done with it, and <laughs> he stops the orchestra. He goes, so now you think you're the soloist. He says, you just drowned out, Mr. Obo. Mr. Obo, you might as well just lay out during that part. We're not going to need you. Mr. Trumpet has that covered well. And matter of fact, I don't think they'll even hear the violins. I have 23 violins here, but I couldn't even hear them. You were playing so loudly. And I'm, he's just way exaggerating. He's just really belittling me in front of me. And he knew my father was there and a lot of people in my community. And I'm just going, oh, man. He goes, you're supposed to blend. I know you're in rock and roll, and you don't understand anything about blending. He says, but... 
if I can hear you, you're playing too loud. And I'm thinking, that would have been good information, oh, about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> so you choose to tell me that now. So I said, okay. He says, well, we're going to start this piece over again. Jesus. By now, people are throwing things at me in the orchestra, and I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm about two inches tall. I'm just humiliated. For, for the 200 bucks I was getting for these two days' work, it wasn't worth it anymore. And so he gets up and he counts, and I, I look over. I, I said, I was distracted. And the second blind player, she's over going, <laughs> you know. I didn't even, never even met her even afterwards, but it was like the, the, she knew why I'd missed it. I'd gotten distracted. Yeah. So now he gets to the spot. He, 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 he won't even leave, but he glanced over and he, you know, and, and I, I faked it. I put the trumpet up against my lips. I really made it look like I was playing. I fingered all the notes. But you didn't play it. And I saw the oboe player stiffen up, and he goes, oh, no. <laughs> you know, and people around me are going, oh, you know, and, and so we get through the part, and he looks at me, and he puts his fingers to his lips, and he goes, and I stood Jesus. up and I yelled, hey, at the top of my lungs. And he stops the orchestra. Now people are really pissed. And I, he said, why did you stop us? He goes, that was beautiful. He says, I taught you something today. You really learned what to do here. He says, why did you stop us? I said, really? I said, because I wanted to make sure for the concert tomorrow night, I don't let you down. Because you seem to have very high standards. So I wanted to know, was that exactly what you wanted to hear? And he goes, I Felt your presence. He goes, I could not hear you drown out any other instruments. He says, that was absolutely perfect. You could play in any symphony if you play like that. I said, really? And now I've got the upper hand. And I said, because you know what? I didn't play one note. And you can check anybody around me and ask them. They all know. Mr. Oboe knows. He played that part by himself this time. And he, I, I said, I, I stuck my first pointer finger in the air. And I said, number one, you don't want me here. And I put my second finger up, and then I said, number two, you don't need me here. And then I dropped my pointer finger, and I said, and I am out of here. And I went over to the band guy, and I said, pay me. And he paid me for the rehearsal. And I said, you don't got to pay me for the gig, because I'm not coming. Man. And I walked out, and my dad came home, and he shook my hand. <laughs> he, goes, uh -huh. he goes, you won. He says, you won. I thought you were, so, you were the town idiot, and you won. Wow. So that's classical music was done. I'm done with that. I teach it. I got kids who can play the snot out of it. Yeah. And I can show them how. Yeah. But I don't. Uh, uh, I'd rather play in a country band. I got to go play with. Uh, and fuck that guy, by the you way. Know, Sorry, yeah, Megan. Well, that guy. You know, and I got to go play with, uh, what was his name? Commander Cody in the Last Planet Airmen a little bit. Go play some country rock type stuff. Yeah. And Little Feet plays that southern country type rock and stuff. So that's my country music. But the legit classical stuff. You can have it. Yeah. It's not part of my world. Wow. <laughs> it's not funky enough anyway. No, man. You know what? If you play something on off 16th, you will get be fined. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I get bonuses. Man. <laughs> yeah. Right. Man, I'm funky as ever. My neck hurts. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's when you know you did it right. And your dog's pregnant. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> and Yolanda died. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Dancing. Yeah. Man. He's full of stories. Oh, he could go and keep going and going. Yeah, sometimes I'll start on a story and I'll get off on a tangent and forget the story oh, I was This happens, I was this it this happens live a lot, too. She, so. the, this, the, my daughter's the voice of reason. She's like, Dad, let's play the next song. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's not talk about that now, okay? No. <laughs> let's talk about how, you know, on Veterans Day, and I'm talking about how Cold Blood bought my way out of the draft. You know, I don't really want to hear that. You how know? did that happen? Yeah. Uh, oh. I was getting drafted and I didn't want to go. It was during Nam. I'm yeah. already playing taps for friends coming home in body bags. Right. I'm going on, it's not a war. You knew what was going on over yeah, there. I'm, I'm not going to do it. So my dad says, well, let's just get you into one of the bands. He goes, let's go over to, the, the, to Treasure Island and audition for the Navy School of Music. He says, one of the best music schools in the world. Sure. He says, you, you know, you, you'll do great going through there and playing in one of the top Navy bands or, or one of those other service bands. And so I do the audition and the guy, and, and including the writing test, and the, and the, the, the fellow comes out and he goes, well, we would love to have you join up and, and, and join us in the Navy. We'll probably put you right in the Navy band after boot camp. He says, but you're going to have to go to the Navy School of Music. And by the way, I will have you teaching at least three classes while you're there. Because I haven't seen arranging and writing like that. And you're, you're playing four different brass instruments professionally. He says, this is, this is, you're exactly the kind of guy we want to have in here. And I look down and I'm going, you know, I just turned down Juilliard and Eastman. And the Guggenheim Institute in Germany, the top classical schools in the world. Yeah. Because they didn't have the kind of music I want to play. And now you're telling me I can go to your school and teach? And teach. I heard you were the best school, and you want a kid to come in and teach? He goes, you have these abilities. I said, 
I want to learn from the best. Yeah. I, I don't think I'm the best. And if you do, I don't belong in your school. Right. <laughs> and my dad looked at me and he goes, oh. He goes, you're going to get drafted. And I go, nah, nah. And I already played on the first Cold Blood album as an extra trumpet. And they said, we just got to keep our player in our – am I telling the wrong story again? Should I not be telling this one? <laughs> Tell anyway, it. they got a shrink and a lawyer, and they said they've been taking care of me all my life. And I was a certified nutcase. And I said – I go into my last draft physical, and I said, give me a gun. Give me a gun. Give me some bullets. I'll shoot the first son of a bitch I see. Give me a gun. I'll shoot you first. You know? And they go, okay. And, uh, and he's read all these psychiatrist letters. And he goes, oh, you're, you're not going to the, the service today. So I walked They might have been right. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure they were. <laughs> we'll never know. <laughs> I have a trumpet, and I know how to use it. Mm -hmm. All those great successful years with the tower hits that we all know and love, and then you left the band. That was my fault. No. <laughs> my wife got pregnant, uh -huh. and, and a month and a half later, I said, I'm, I'm out of here. Wow. I said, I'm not, you know. You know, it's really funny. Uh, uh, about seven months later, I go out to play with me and Lenny Pickett from the Saturday Night Live Band. He was our original, our second sax player. Yeah. And uh, we got asked to go play with the Beach Boys on the 4th of July. And Reagan was the president. It was 1984. That was, was two weeks after I was born. Yeah, she was born June 20th, and this yeah. was the 4th of July. So it was two weeks after she was born. Okay. And we're living in L.A. and just scratching out a living. I'm, I'm trying to, to break down some doors in, in L.A. And not, you know, there's deep lines down there. They're great old cats, so I wasn't going to get In 1984, break. you were having a hard time making a living in L.A.? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, you, you got to get in line and waiting behind these guys. The, 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 see, there's a system in L.A. with the yeah. old cats. Yeah. And the contractors who right. control everything have their guys. They hire, and they'll, they'll do three or four sessions a day, and they're kicking back part of the dough to them. Right, and here comes this newcomer who's probably not. He's, You're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> no, make I mean, you I'm let or with, not. I'm working with Quincy Jones and Stephen Foster and David yeah, Foster. David and I, Foster. So the Lady Pick and I get asked to go play uh, on the Fourth of July. So you know, you work hard all your life to get the good gigs and and be able to play any kind of music that's in front of you. And and they tell me they're going to pay me two thousand dollars to fly out there and play forty five minutes set with the band, and it's all whole notes. Uh, good news, good way, uh -huh. uh, This is all whole notes. I mean, you know, one of my third grade students could have done this gig. Wow. And Lenny, Lenny, Lenny Pickett's in there. Uh, help me run, help, help me run. Uh, oh, we get to change notes. Oh, help me <laughs> yeah. Notes. Uh, so we're, we're, we're out there to play, and then we're standing on stage. And, uh, Where was at, this? Uh, Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, it's on the 4th of July. It's yeah. 1 o'clock in the afternoon. There 700,000 people showed up. And we're on the Forrest Gump stage looking down the Washington Mall at the, at the monument. And there's a entire Woodstock on each side of the pool. I mean, there there were so many people. They said there were over seven hundred thousand people there. Wow, there that day. Jeez. And I was standing on stage, and this is pretty, this is gonna be an easy gig. Let's let's do this. You know, Ringo Starr is on stage with us, Julio Iglesias, all kind of these big, big uh, uh, entertainers, and. Uh, President Reagan standing on stage. He brought the Beach Boys there. He was the California, you know, governor and president. Right, right. He loved the Beach Boys. He brought them out there to play this, and. Uh, he looks, he, we're just getting ready to start, and he turns around and goes, wait a minute, boys, uh, I've got an idea. He goes, boys, Independence Day, look at all these Americans here today. I hear there's close to three quarters of a million of them here. They should have their national anthem. Boys, play the Star Spangled Banner for him. He just, he just had this epiphany, and he goes, play it rock and roll style, Beach Boy style, any way you want. Play the national anthem. He's so proud. He's and they're all looking at each other like, holy shit, what are we going to do? How did you know? We the, Carl Wilson looks over at Jay Johnson. He goes, ah. Oh. And he's trying to find some chords. He has no idea. He looks over at the bass player. He goes, can you? And he goes, I never played that in my life. <laughs> he looks over at, at Mike Love, the lead singer. And, Mike, you can sing this right. And he goes, oh, I always mess it up. Somebody write down the words for me. So they were, they're, uh, they're thinking, what are we going to do? And all you just got called out by the president to yeah, play the national yeah, anthem. And, and, you and can't not play it. There was a party atmosphere on stage, you know, thirty seconds ago, and now it's right. Pss, took the air right out oh, of it. So, uh, so President Mr. Reagan looks over at his Secret Service guy Bob. It turns out standing about five feet away, and he goes, "Bob, uh, we really should have the the national anthem. Uh, let's play the, the Marine Band recording." And and Bob, for only time all day, I saw his eyes. He, was, he lowered his glasses. He looked over the rim of his glasses at the president, and Reagan goes. You did bring that, didn't you? <laughs> uh, no, sir. He turned the gut in Carl Wilson's this face. The story is the best. <laughs> I know, I can't. It, it, it just gets deeper. He gets in Carl Wilson's face and goes, We have a band here today. He says, You mean to stand here in front of the President of the United States on the 4th of July anthem. and tell him you can't play the national anthem? It's called the Star Spangled Banner. Have you ever heard of it? He's just. 
he was trying to cover himself because he blew it, not bringing the right. Backup. He didn't bring it. Yeah, right. So now Reagan walks over to Bob and go, Bob, Bob, Bob. You know, you know uh, we don't need this. And now it is dead silent on the stage, and all these people are standing up front waiting for music to start. And it's just like this, uh, uh, and then he pick it, elbows me in the ribs, and he goes, Mick, do something. Let's go. And I said. You know, I'll play it on my trumpet if you like. And all the beach boys, oh, yeah, he plays it. He plays it really good. And they never heard me play. They just <laughs> figured they were off the hook. And, and, and uh, the president says, oh, you could play this? I, I said, I played it at an Oakland A's game about three days ago. I said, I'd be honored to play it. I love to play our national anthem. I said, I don't jazz it up too much. I play it pretty legitimate. I said, but yeah. I'd love to play our national anthem. I'd be most honored. And he turns around and looks at that sea of people out there. And he goes, you're sure uh, you start this uh, – Oh, my gosh, I remember one day Frank Sinatra went to sing at Dodger Stadium. He forgot the words and ran off the field. And it was a disaster. And I'm going, oh, oh no, sir. <laughs> I said, I'm no Frank Trumpet Sinatra. Trumpet players, don't, don't forget the words. <laughs> I I said, word. <laughs> I'm no Frank Sinatra, but I can play this, and I would be most honored. He goes, well, okay, then. What's your name? And I told him my name. He walks me up to the microphone in the middle of the stage. I'm, President Reagan walks me up to the front of this stage. <laughs> it's a huge stage. It's uh-huh. 12 feet high. And, you know, and he, he, he goes, Everybody, please rise. I don't know if you have any idea what it sounds like when 700,000 people stand up at the same moment, but it's like the atmosphere moved up about four feet. Jeez. If there were clouds, they, you know, it sounded like the buffalo coming over a hill at you. I, I, every time I remember the sound, I still got goosebumps. And he goes, please remove your cups. And Mick Gillette is going to play our national anthem. And he stands right next to me. And I'm walking on the microphone going, <laughs> I'm walking on the microphone going, <laughs> okay, I either really stuck my foot in it this time, yeah. or and I closed my eyes and played the first few notes, ba ba ba, and I went, oh, piece of cake. Yeah. And I played it, and I got I'm going nice and strong. I put a little, I put a couple uh-huh. little bitty things in it, you know. And about about halfway through it, I'm in the middle of the song. I feel this clamp on my on my shoulder, and I and I glance up, and President, he's a big man, and he's standing next to me, just. Beaming at me, man, and I'm playing, and I get to the end of the song, and I da, 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 and I stick my fist in the air, and I yell, "Play ball!" <laughs> Boom! I'm getting the band starts into good vibrations, and they're just rocking. President Ring it spins me around, gives me this big hug, and he goes, "Young man, you saved the day." And uh, I, I tell this, I teach this at my clinics. I'm a, I'm a Yamaha clinician. I teach this to the kids. I say, you know, you you always play your best. I said the one rule is you're always performing. Don't practice. Practicing is a waste of time. We all know what practicing is trying. Yeah. We all know what Yoda said about trying. Right. Don't fuck with Yoda. Yeah. You know, there is no try. Do or, do, do, or not. do not. You know, and, and if you're always playing your best, always play the best you can. Next time it'll be as good or better. Right. And you that will be your standard. You will always be playing your best. And when I walked up and I, I doubted myself for a second, as soon as I started playing, I realized this is the way I play. It's not a hard song to play. You know, you know what the hardest song in the world to play is on a trumpet? What? Taps. Oh, man. Oh, my God. Wait, before you get off into that, <laughs> I just want to say, Mick <laughs> just asked me, I don't know if you know what it feels like to have the president put his arm around you and to stare down 750,000 people. And you, you went on with your story, but in my head, I'm thinking... It's a visual, isn't it? No, no, Mick. I don't know what yeah. that feels like. No, nobody knows. Exactly zero people it besides you know what life. that feels like. One of the top ten. That was like I when, bet, man. When I, when I did the last, nobody else knows what that feels when like. When I did when the I, last national anthem at Candlestick Park, Willie Mays came in and, and put his arm on me and walked me onto the field. And we weren't even supposed to go out there yet. And he just walked me right out to second base. <laughs> and I'm in tears. I, I got sunglasses on because I'm crying because Willie Mays has me. Man. Yeah. Mick Mick played for seven hundred thousand people with the Beach Boys, where he saved the day for President Reagan, uh-huh. and that made his top ten. <laughs> yeah, that's among the most memorable moments. I'm gonna cry of, of the eighties that, that I think back. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that particular year it was one of the that that particular year. year. I'm, I'm such a lucky guy. Oh, My man. grandpa, oh, I'm. I'm <laughs> I, I'm half, but I'm mostly Irish. My grandpa was from Ireland. He, he named me Mick. He says that's the worst thing you can call an Irishman. Yeah. He says when somebody calls you Mick, you just smile at him and go, "Yeah, you know that's that's your name." And I've loved my name all my life. And that's uh, and I was telling somebody earlier when I first time I met Mick Jagger, I told him he was the reason there was no K on my name, and he had no idea what I was talking about. Stuck that big lip out. He goes, "What? A no K? You don't spell it with a K?" I, I love your Ronald Reagan and your Mick Jagger <laughs> imitation. <laughs> They're all pretty much the same. It's the same imitation. <laughs> yeah. 
The one, one was taller. A, one just a bigger <laughs> lip. <laughs> yeah. He had a big black car. Oh, man. So, uh, man, that's a tough story to top. Yeah. No Where do we go from there? It got silly. <laughs> it got pretty silly. And then I stepped back into the horn section. Uh, uh, never, like 45 hey, minutes with the whole notes. Yeah. <laughs> you can actually find that concert on YouTube. Yeah, they just started showing it. Like, yeah. Oh, wow. I, I haven't seen the anthem part of it yet, but you can see me playing with the, that. Yeah. I'll be watching that tonight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's Somebody's a long one, but it's pretty footage. cool. It's yeah. like, Beach, uh, Beach Boys, 4th of July, America, 1984. I think America starts the show off. And then yeah. Julio comes out in La Toya. La Toilet. <laughs> La Toya. Wow. That was back when the Beach Boys had that thing with uh, Alexander Haig, right around that time, wasn't no, it? Oh before? no, James Watt. James Watt. Yeah, yeah. they had us. They, somebody made us all T-shirts and said James Watt was right. Right. <laughs> it was the biggest <laughs> joke going there. That's funny. But after the show was over, we were in the dressing room. We were getting ready to come home. I, I'm dying to get home. I yeah. had my best band gig in a while, and I got a bunch of cash in my pocket. And uh, we're in the dressing room, putting our horns away, and the president and his little entourage comes walking into the dressing room and walks right by all the Beach Boys, right by Ringo Starr, walks straight over to me and shakes my hand and thanks me again wow. in front of all these people. And I'm just going, you know, I think you're the first Republican I've ever liked. And they lost it. <laughs> <laughs> so you show up. Yes. You're in L.A. Ruining the party. You guys, you guys lived in L.A. That's one of what, the top you do? moments of my life is her showing up. Aw. That's I'm, better than staring down 700,000 people. <laughs> <at> oh. <laughs> you could have doubled that. So you were living in L.A. at the time. Mm-hmm. And you quit the band. Yeah, I left the band and uh, just, you know, shuffling around. I actually was looking for day jobs. I learned how to drive a forklift. I was, I was just putting around in, in warehouses and stuff in LA, learning how to, you know, the other half lives. And, and you know, we, see, Tower, people, people had the wrong conception. It was a 10 piece band. You yeah. know, and, and we, you, when you get the booking agent and the management and and the crew and the tour companies it's and all cut, stuff, cutting that up a lot of ways. That's a little bitty piece of the pie. You know, the band gets less than half the money. Yeah, and it's a ten piece, eleven piece band at that right. time. So you know, the, there was no money ever to speak up. You know, there was one year. There was one year I made about thirteen thousand dollars. You know, it was, there was some hard times. It didn't help that the leaders of the band were way deep in drugs and couldn't write any more good songs, and it just the band was. Going, yeah. That's you know. That's about time. I, I got to go. I went and played with Blood, Sweat, and Tears for a little while. Okay. You know. That's a great gig for a trumpet player. Yeah, yeah. yeah no kidding. It was. It, it, it was. And, and those are all over YouTube, too. You can see some of the old stuff at the Elkhorn Saloon. What a horn section that was. It was a three-piece. Yeah. Oh, man. We were doing a song with David Clayton Thomas. <laughs> he, was, he did his own famous song, Heidi, Heidi Ho. It was one of their big hits. Uh-huh. And they they do the song in E-flat. But every time he yelled Heidi, I'd blast a Heidi out of my trumpet. Pretty strong, yeah. nice, clean high D. <laughs> yeah. really not in the key he, of the song. He said. He and, called for it. Yeah, and about the fourth time, he stopped the band. He goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm just following directions. <laughs> and he goes, high D. He goes, we're going to have to change the key of this song. I said, yeah, yell high E flat. I'll, I'll play whatever you want. <laughs> Man. That's why you don't give a drum player a microphone. Mm-mm. I guess not. No. Mm-hmm. So you make my job easy. Let's go through that chronology, <laughs> yeah. though. So you're, you're down there putzing around. You're... Yeah, Megan gets born. I'm, I'm doing occasional sessions, not too much. Uh, uh, I, I had a guy who I'd really, uh, I don't really want to name him, but I had set him up in the studios down there. Yeah. He was now working because we were so busy. Uh, I, I, got, I introduced him to Quincy Jones and David Foster and John Stronach and some of these really top, Bill Schmidt, some of the top uh, producers in L.A. And uh, then uh, I found out I, I'm having trouble getting work. I'm knocking on people's doors going, you know, I, I know you're still producing a lot of albums. I'd love to come, you know, work with you again. And he says, well, I'm using this other guy now. And he tells me not to use you because you don't blend with anybody else. If you aren't playing lead in that horn section, not to use you. And I said, I checked with him. I called him up. I said, Did you? he goes, yeah, well, he's, I got my own guys. And we, we, we're doing it. And we blend together better. I went, Thanks a lot, man. Enjoy your life. <laughs> I'm the phone, you know, and I, I, I don't want to name him. He's, he's kind of a well-known guy. But uh, he, he got, I set his life up. I set his life up, and he's had a great, great career. And I'll tell you why I don't want to name him. He's got a tumor on his neck now the size of a grapefruit. Wow. And they tell him if he takes it off, he's not going to play anymore. So I just leave that alone. Karma took care of him. No kidding. I'm blessed to have the most wonderful family. I'm all about family, man. This is this is my life is good. I'm a happy man. Music is flowing throughout me all the time. I'm yeah. honoring my father whenever I play. You are clearly living a great life, man, because you look like a million bucks. You look like you got another 50 years ahead of you. Oh, I love her now. Thank God. Mm-hmm. 
and you, you get to play music with your daughter. Is that the best? Yeah. That is so cool. It is very Anything cool. Anything my daughter does, I love. You I know? can't I'm even like, are you watching same. TV? Yeah. You know, when you get a chance, <laughs> when you get a chance, listen to Cold Cold Heart on the on the new album. Oh. What we did, we played at an old club over here called Armando's, and during the, the she, she, it's she, Armando's and Martinez. Yeah. 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 She's yeah. joint we all know this, and love. It's just mm-hmm. a quiet little band with Jason putting this beautiful, sneaky little stuff behind her. Yeah. And uh, then I, I uh, grabbed my horn. I went out into the audience, on the far end of the audience, and I played back for her from across the room. And there was some just, man, the hairs were standing up on everybody's arms. It was magic, man. Oh, man. It was really a communication thing. Her- he doesn't like me at all. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Clearly obvious. Oh, wait, don't, don't start me about my grandsons, Jesus. No, don't ever ask him about the softball either because he was, <laughs> he was my coach forever. Yeah. He did softball. That she was, was an NCAA like... softball player. She had huge scholarships. And, and, you, and you coached softball. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. And plus she's been a published songwriter since she was seven years old. You know, Get down. No, she got her Go own ahead, Megan. Captures. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, they were going to kick me out of the family if I didn't do something. Oh, okay. So. She right. was afraid to sleep in the dark. You were singing for your supper. <laughs> we, we wrote a song together called Let Me Be Your Nightlights about your parents being there for you. And, stuff. and it wasn't no Mickey Mouse little song. It was, I had Chester Thompson on keyboards and, yeah. and come, my, come my pals, you know. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, Tom Pollock. And you guys cut it and you sang on it? Yeah, oh, yeah. we have a kid's we have, tape. We have, Get uh, down. Uh, no, yeah, Nouveau Kids. Is, it, we put out as a cassette and it was, you know, nominated for awards and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, people were just going, wow, after they played it for people they're going my kids won't sleep with a light on anymore they think it's really cool that their parents are there for them you know so, let me be your nightlights the song and they're saying you got any other songs and we're going well we will and so we go on that night after after performance of it and i say uh, let's write another song she goes okay I, I say well you got any ideas what would you like to sing about she goes and i went okay uh, let's see what she goes she says are there any rainbows at night Perplexing stuff. You know? I, <laughs> she's, she's seven years old. And I said, are you kidding me? She goes, yeah, maybe they're like just dark blue and purple and brown and you can't really see them. Again. I'm going, what a... So we wrote a song called Rainbows of the Night. And it's this beautiful little song. We ended up putting a, putting a whole album together of, of kids' songs. And she had some of her buddies in her old school who sang in church choirs, mm-hmm. come sing with her and stuff. And brought some of my good friends, like Stevie Keys from Journey, come play keyboard. And I said, oh, my pals. And we just... Put the scene together, and it was, just, it was magic, man. Wow. For magic. a second there, I thought you were, stuff. <laughs> For a second there, I thought he was going to say that she wrote Rainbow in the Dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rainbows of the Night. It was a beautiful song. And it's never been on anything but a cassette, so nobody hears it anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm thinking about putting, okay. releasing it on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's all right with you? <laughs> nobody even does CDs anymore, I'm finding out, man. I, I don't I, own a CD player. I have no way to play that CD. Yeah. Not you know what? Even? We have to figure oh, out wow. how to... Uh, had to get this. Well, we just sent stuff we'll to CD Baby of the new album, so it's, it should be going on iTunes pretty quick. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So, yeah, yeah everything's digital, I guess, nowadays. days. But, I, you know, you can't sign that. People come to gigs, they like getting this, buying the CDs and have the band sign That's them true. and stuff, you know? I still like the albums. I still go for sure. albums. That's nothing like the pop. I've got such crack. a vinyl yeah. collection. There's a company that we uh, we uh, work with a lot of times. They're called the New York Rock Exchange, and they kind of do that. They mm-hmm. sell shares of the song. So like, yeah, they'll, they'll break off a tiny chip of the song that that you can buy an ownership share, and of. you actually get you know like your name on the copyright registry in the oh Library of Congress. And so and the it's, fan, it's a minute yeah. thing for the yeah for the fans' well, share, and it you is. can actually donate your royalty yeah to charity. So oh, that's you know, awesome. every, oh, that's cool. you get a few bucks every, and then you can design like what would be an album yes. cover, you know that you know, and and so now they've got that for that thing. purpose. Wow. Right. wow, and it's just a great way to. For an artist to really reach their core fans that's, that's and have them cool. participate with what's going yeah, on, yeah, because really, really cool. Especially, you know, I mean, we were kind of the last to grow up with that tactile mm-hmm. experience of having Something a record. You can touch. I mean, and you're yeah. looking at the band, and oh, you're yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't scratch it. No, <laughs> <laughs> all the work that went into the album cover too, like the, the wording, the secret messages, the yeah. pictures, all of it was in yeah. there. And that's all. That's all gone now. I've you know? got the yeah. entire collection of Tower Power LPs unopened. Wow. wow! From East Bay Grease, all the ones, all the ones I played on. I've yeah. got, I have every one of them. Wow! Yeah, I got offered three hundred fifty bucks for the East Bay Grease one on open. I'm, I've just never let it go. Well, as far as like getting your fans involved too, we did a for this album. We did a Kickstarter. Oh my uh, god! Campaign. Go. Yeah. Oh, the Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, funded friend the of ours came and said, "We well, yeah. should try this." Right on. And we had so many people oh, you know, just come in and and were so generous and right. really got it taken care of. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's it's huge. This crowdfunding thing is is, is it's something special. It for is. Sure. It's really cool. And, and then they feel like they're a part of it, and, and it's really cool. They are a part of it. <laughs> I mean, they, but they feel. I mean, they, you know, and and There's for names uh, in the album. 
for certain stuff. donations, you get certain, you know, things. That, you know, I'll, I'll call you up. I'll play Still Young Man for you on the phone for somebody's birthday or something. You know, here, I can do my own little things like that. Hey, I man, that's awesome. <laughs> that's a great, great thing because you're yes. giving somebody an experience that's special. Very personal. And maybe it's not the same as looking down the Potomac Mall and seeing 750,000 people. <laughs> no. But... You know, you got a phone call from Mick Gillette, and he played Still a Young Man for you over the telephone. Yeah, somebody's birthday. I, he's right, look at that. He's called, he's called, hey, is John there? Yeah. Hold your phone back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'll play it for him. You know, what the hell? We actually hand-delivered one album to a local guy. <laughs> hand-delivered. It showed yeah. up yeah, with knocked it. Knocked on the door. It's like Christmas Eve or something. Is Bud Brickle here? He says, hey, man, I buy job. He goes, are you? I said, yeah, I'm here. here. here, man. Was that really the guy's name? Yeah. <laughs> All right. He's right here in Concord, man. He lives here in Concord. Yeah, and and this is, uh, you know, we're committing this to posterity. Hey, man. So you know right what? on, we want to yeah. link you up on our website and on our Facebook page and have people tune into this. Yeah. You know, this, this, you, what you guys are doing is really cool. And, and uh, this is the first time I've been asked to do this. Yeah. And I, if I never do another one, I've been really happy about oh, this. Oh, no, no. You're doing another one. Well, you know and, what? And we're going to be the second guys to ask you to do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm here for you. Whatever you want, yeah. man. Well, he doesn't I'll, have enough stories. So. I'll never. Yeah. I'll never. Yeah. Yeah. What's he going to talk about you next? You said my start when I think of the rest. Like, I only told you about a third of the Ronald Reagan story. So, you know, some other time. We'll I haven't even that. gotten to start yet. What the heck? No. <laughs> so uh, do, do take a minute and hype all of your uh, social media stuff so that's out there. Everybody can know how to find you Please, guys. Man. Yeah. Well, our website is www.mickgilletteband.com. And then the Facebook page, Mick Gillette Band, MGB. We're pretty good about responding to people. So if you have questions or you know, want us to play a certain area, please let us know. We're booking up this 2015, and we're looking forward to seeing you guys out we there. We found that booking agents have a little problem with us because they don't know what niche. They want. They're looking mm-hmm. for niches. We're not a cover band. You know, we're not just an original. We're not a hard rock band. We play funk, jazz, soul, R&B, you know, yeah. uh, rock, you know, and we're playing some strong stuff and all kinds of things. We, we don't know what maneuver. to call ourselves. Yeah. It was the same problem Tower had originally with Warner Brothers Records. They didn't know how to market us. Yeah. <laughs> what are you guys? Yeah, so that's the Come here. Tell us, please. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, what are you? It's an issue you've dealt with all your life. Friends yeah. of the near famous. You know, but, what are you going to call it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you can't just be a, a band that provides a good time. Well, we're a party band. We're I mean, a good that's, band. We're, that's uh, you the know thing. What is it what if you? How do you classify that? Well, yeah. I classify it. I'm, I want to have a good time. We're a exactly. fucking band. Yeah. We're, a, we're a, band a dance band. band. Yep. Uh, people get up and dance when we play. Mm-hmm. We're playing some more. We play this old Candy State and two men. I would love to hear your reaction after you, you hear the album. It's got some stuff on there. We're doing the Little Feet Rock stuff. We do. I do uh, Unchain My Heart. You know, we just lost Joe Cocker, so I'm yeah. doing his version of that. The old Cold Blood song. Watch your step. Megan is tearing some stuff up on this album. It's a fun, fun live set. Like if you don't have fun, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, <laughs> we lost yeah. Wayne Henderson this last year. The trombone player from the Jazz Crusaders. I put "Put It Where You Want It," their version of it on the album. Mm-hmm. There's some, you know, just we're touching our roots and our, all the people that touched us and giving back. Man, this is all about giving back. What's funny is the songs. There's kind of a theme through the songs on our album. It's almost like anti love. <laughs> it's like an anti love album, right? <laughs> on accident. We got a song yeah. called we "Got a Song Called What's the Matter with Your Mind." You know, <laughs> so we're playing Valentine's Day up at Twin Pines Casino <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> with yeah. our anti love. Right. right. That's yeah. a hell of a thing to notice after the record's done. You go, man. You know what? You huh. know, what? we're kind of making fun of some love here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The guys in the band tell me, "Hey, Mick, you write dark songs." I said, "Well, you know, I wrote one. I, I went in for an eye exam. They told me I, I may have a growth in, behind my right eye socket, and that's not a good place to have a growth back in the brain pan." And then it turns out I just had a 5% eye stroke for some reason, and it caused a little swelling in the back of my eye. Well, for a month, I thought I had a brain tumor, and I was gone. Wow. I thought I was cooked. And I was just... That put you in a dark place. I, yeah. was, I was just staying awake, you know, 23 hours a day. I was trying to stay awake all the time, just to, you know, do as much stuff as I could. Do the and Warren Zevon thing, right? Then, yeah. then, then, when, I, then yeah. when I found out, it was just, there was nothing back there. I mean, literally, I'm a trouble player. There was nothing in there. You just needed a nap. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I did is, is I went to sleep for about 48 hours, and when I See? woke up, uh-huh. <laughs> I woke up, I wrote this song called I Am the Monster from Under Your Bed. Mm-hmm. And it's about, you know, a little kid, you know, you, you know, don't get out of bed in the middle of the night, you know, there's a little monster under your bed, you know. Man. And it's just this hilarious dark humor song, and you know, you know, I you know I'd get you if it weren't for your dad, you know. Just, there's some really funny little lyrics in it. Yeah, that's on our other album, yeah. Doggy. Mm-hmm. You know, and there another song on the new album is Now That I Found You, uh uh I Ain't Got Time for the Likes of You. It's just this, you know, <laughs> Dark songs, anti love. Man, anti love. Mm-hmm. Anti love. Well, the CD is called Turning Two. Yes, yep. and you guys had a lot of twos that 
went into the title of this uh, of this piece of work? It's our second album. Yeah. My oldest grandson just turned two. Just turned two. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's a baseball theme thing. We have just so much baseball and softball go through us here. I play a lot of national anthems for the Giants. I have for many years. Yeah. And I got to do uh, Willie Mays' 80th birthday celebration. It was live on ESPN, and it was coincidentally the next day was my 60th. So we they they put my anthem. They said, "Do something special. You know, do something. You're gonna be, he's he's gonna be right near you. And you're gonna be playing the national anthem. You know, at the end of the presentation, and the anthem, and then the ball game. And so I thought, well. How about this? <laughs> Megan came out on the field with me, and she handed me horns because I started it on tuba. Boop, 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 boop. And then I got about halfway through it, I switched to trombone, and I rolled and the you tuba. worked your way up? And then I finished screaming on trumpet, and it was uh, nobody did, uh, nobody's done anything. It's on YouTube. All wow. my anthems are on YouTube. You can see them. Sometimes I use a bunch of my trumpet students, my high school kids come play with me. So. Yeah. And, uh, but that the, the, but baseball is always <laughs> It's a baseball theme. theme. So uh, turning yeah. two is, is the term for turning a double play in baseball. Right, right, right. And she's such a ball player and, and, and a coach and, and, and manager and teacher and everything. The cover is uh, her sliding in a second and me getting ready to throw the ball to first base, so we're turning two. Yeah. You've always known for having a quick pivot. That's true. <laughs> I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. I'm bihornial. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I play trumpet and trombone. I'm, I'm changing a, the subject uh-huh. quick. Uh-huh. No, I, what position did you play? I, I'm, I'm a, a double Taurus. All right. <laughs> I'm a double Taurus. Two horns, you know? That's what it is. So the record's called Turning Two. Everybody go out there and get it. And see the Michelet band at Twin Pines Casino. Twin Pines Casino on March 13th. There you go. Where's Twin Pines? Cas- it's Twin Pines. Up Casino. in Middletown, uh, near Calistoga. Oh, Middletown. That's yeah. yeah. Halfway between Calistoga and Clear Lake. It's on Highway 29. It's about two hours from here. Nice room. It's an hour and a half max. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yep. Okay. Well, Twin Pines. We got Casino. a nice hotel up there. It's Valentine's. Come on up, be sweetheart. And- Here's some good music. Some Listen to a couple love. of anti-love songs, but you'll be yeah. dancing. Oh, you'll be dancing. And you'll it'll be set laughing. set the mood for later. We keep some humor. Yeah. We keep some humor. <laughs> so, hey, man, that's a great note to end it on. And, I, you know, I certainly don't take your time for granted, but abs- 100% we want to do this again. I love it. You know, it, 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 as you can see, when my grand, I'm Irish. I got the gift of gab. That doesn't mean it's all going to be good, but I can keep talking forever. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, we had Megan and I had a 1,100 count rest, and then we said about 17 words. That's and right. So this was the easiest podcast man, we've no ever kidding. done. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Mick. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. I really Thank appreciate guys. it. This is great.